get into the weeds today. We're not going to have a policy world discussion, okay? We're going to try to frame how we're going to pay for Medicare for All in ways that you can go out and talk to your members and your community, okay? Good, good. So we're going to use some numbers that are estimates taken from a couple of different sources. We know there are tons of sources out there, and you guys know them all, um, but just bear with us as we use these numbers to, as a general guide um, as we walk through how we're going to pay for that scary um, And just a couple points up front, we know we already spend enough really? money to pay for Medicare for All. We can cover everyone with comprehensive care and spend less. And there's plenty of money out there. The rich have it, and we're going to take it back. <laughs> burden for paying for health care. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. No, I feel more like a cool rock star if I have the hand on mic. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to do, some of you were in the workshop yesterday, so I'm going to ask you to uh, don't give away the answers, okay, to the following question. Uh, but for everybody else, think about like the top 100 biggest corporations in America. How much do you think CEOs make a year? Give me some numbers. 375 times what average workers make. Well, here's the answer. Whoa! 842 to 1. Top 100 companies, CEOs make $30 million a year, average workers make $36,000. Uh, just a practical note, this is an average over a decade, and it changes a lot. Anyway, um, this is what it looks like. So, it is sick. So I want to look a little bit about how we got here. Um, this one, right? Yeah, right. right. Um, so in your field downs, this That's is the bottom quarter. line of your chart, the red line up here. This is productivity. Productivity is a measure that economists use of what we produce in a given hour collectively. Um, all our goods, all our services. And it goes up over time. If you're in a functioning, productive society, you expect that that line will go up over time. It used to be that at the same time productivity went up, so did wages. So top line on your chart, or bottom line on your chart, blue line up here, those are real wages, average weekly wages. Starting back from World War II to the 70s, wages went up along with productivity. And that was taught as fact in graduate schools for economists. That any economist you stopped on the street would tell you, of course, when productivity goes up, wages go up. That's how it works. Well, it's not working. So from the late 70s, early 80s to today, weekly wages have stayed flat and even run down at various times. So from 1945, we went, we, it was $500 a week. Now it's $746 a week. Wow. It is pathetic. All of this productivity that we as workers created, the value of that has gone up to the 1% instead of to us. If that hadn't happened, if productivity and wages had kept rising together, that little dotted white line, average weekly wages today would be $1,377. Almost twice as much, right? Around $1,400, around $750. Think about your own paycheck. Think about paycheck of your members in your family, members of your union. What if it were twice as much? You would live in a 
fundamentally different kinds of people. So that's yeah. what they've taken from us. There's a lot of ways that happens. Somebody mentioned Reagan. There's a long list of reasons. One of them is tax policy. Um, this is just the Times the other day. It's like actually a cool animated graphic. Check it out. But, uh, so lower uh, percentiles of income, 0 to 10% percentile, goes up all the way here. So it used to be, if you made less money, you paid the least in taxes. 18% or so, way over in this big car in. The richest in 1950 paid about 30%. Um, taxes. Today, here's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. I haven't changed on that end very much. The richest 400 families in America pay less tax than the poorest people in America. And the result of that, of that policy and lots of other things that have happened those years, is this massive transfer of wealth. In 1989, collectively, the top 1% had $18 trillion of wealth. <laughs> the bottom 50% collectively had less than a trillion, 0. 0.7 trillion. Today, that top 1% has 29.5 trillion dollars collectively. Bottom 50%? Negative. Collectively in debt to the tune of 0. 0.2 trillion dollars. Can somebody open the back door? Somebody's not in back door. This is the result. So all of the money that we're looking for went to the 1%. So when Catherine said at the beginning, rich have it, this is literal, literal and comfortable. Is that a word? Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't even know what the slide for. Okay, sorry. Uh, it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now that we uh, now that we know where all the money went, uh, let's talk a little bit about Medicare for all and what we want from our Medicare for All program. So we want universal coverage, right? We want comprehensive coverage with all of those wonderful things, including long-term care. And when we do that, we won't have any underinsured folks either, right? We want a just transition for the workers who are gonna lose their jobs as a result of the cost savings. We want increased equity for underserved populations in rural areas. And we want to eliminate cost barriers to care. So we're gonna eliminate co-pays, premiums, and deductibles, and, and have somebody else pay for that. Okay, so here's the great news. We currently, our country currently spends $3.24 trillion a year on healthcare. Medicare for all, with all of those things that we just talked about, actually cost less, 2.96 trillion. Per year. Per year, that is correct. So, it seems a little too good to be true, doesn't it? Okay, we're gonna take a look at that. Because this is the really important thing. This is the savings that come from switching from a employer-based private insurance system to a one-payer, single-payer system that everybody is in. We're going to save 9% of our current budget on administration. So that includes all the billing, um, collection of co-pays, uh, it's the profit and the enormous CEO salaries that health insurance executives make. We're also going to be able to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies <coughs> to lower drug prices, and that's going to save another 5.9%. We're going to set uniform rates for doctors and hospitals, 2.8%, and elimination of, of waste and fraud for a total of 19.2%. So those cost savings are what makes that chart that I just showed you plausible and possible. <laughs> okay, so what's the source for those? Uh, that's the UMass Perry uh, study that came out last November. In December, so in December. Yes, yes. Sorry. Um, yeah, um, Robert Cole is the uh, main author of that of that study. Um, okay, so. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about um, how we're going to pay for 
that lower cost that we still need to pay for it because we're not rid of all of the individual payments, the premiums and the co and everything, right? So what we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep all the existing taxes on Medicare, you know, we all pay 1.45% in payroll tax, Medicare, so do our employers. Um, there are also uh, taxes raised for Medicaid. That All of that is the 1.88 trillion. So we still need to raise 1.08 trillion. Lots of ideas out there about how to get under that, right? The wealth tax is the one we hear most about. Um, so I like to run, I can't really wrap my mind around on using money that these people have. So I like to run little experiments and things. Um, so I did one. This is Martha Millionaire. <laughs> She's got $50 million. God forbid we put a 2% wealth tax on her. She pays that 2% wealth tax every year. Let's just pretend she doesn't make any more money somehow. After 10 years of paying that tax, she would have $42 million. I feel okay about that. <laughs> yes. um, this is Brad Billionaire, because Ray, his name is Brad. Um, he's got a billion dollars. A billion dollars is so much money. If he paid a 3% tax for 10 years, he would have three quarters of a billion dollars, which is enough to spend $15 million a year for 50 years. It's enough to spend $40,000 a day for 50 years, more than the average worker makes, right? After he pays his onerous wealth tax. So I'm okay with wealth tax. Uh, so another little thought experiment I wanted to do. Well, what happens if we just transferred some of this money back from 1% to 50%? What if we just like took a trillion dollars off the top, sent it down to the 1%, it makes no difference, right? That pretty much the same height. And and what the bottom fifty percent have is still measly, but that one trillion dollars that we pay that we would transfer down would fundamentally transform the lives of tens of millions of people. And so this is what we want you guys to walk away with. The money is there, period. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I skipped, I think I skipped the arrow. I skipped one of these slides just to oh, save on the <laughs> I think it's there. Okay. Slide well, there you go. Um, all right, so now we want to put this back on you guys. Uh, we're going to pass out a sheet, and uh, we want in your tables, you guys are going to talk together. Um, and. I'm going to give you your assignment. So in your small groups to tables, please review the information. You guys, some people in here think, well, maybe there should be an additional tax. That's fine. You know, we can continue to have that conversation. Um, but we need to understand the terms of the debate. And fundamentally, the money is there. Now let's talk about, you know, how to get it from, from where. Um, those are the details. But I think, right, as a movement, we need to fundamentally um, be able to frame the debate. So when someone walks up to us at a table and says, you know, sounds great, but it's too expensive. Um, then we need to be able to say, well, actually, you know, the money's there, we need to make it a priority. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want us to keep us on time. So I've got you guys some lunch on time. So I'm gonna turn it back to Catherine. If we have time at the end, we'll do a little more QA. Okay, great. So um, I really like the way you, you frame it, right? Like why see the taxes before we even get to the bargaining table, right? So, um, so we want to now talk a little bit about um, some of these other plans that are out there. Has anybody been watching the Democratic oh, president? Yeah. Oh, okay. no, no, no. So, I mean, it's amazing. Yes, it's 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 this morning, the first question is always Medicare for all. This is unbelievable that this is what's in the debate, yeah. right? It but, really is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, center around this question of how we're going to pay for it, right? What I understand is they're not telling us how they're going to pay for their plans, right? So we need to turn the tables on that on that question, right? So um, let's go... Okay. 
So let's go back to this chart that we looked at before, right? Right now we're spending 3.24. Medicare for all costs 2.96 trillion, right? And we're getting universal coverage and cost savings. So what about these plans, these candidates who say, oh, I'm for universal coverage, but we have to keep private insurance because it's politically practical or pragmatic, right? So what, are, what would that look like? Well, Universal coverage, no cost savings, right? Wow. So, so where is Joe Biden getting these numbers, right? I mean, so we need to ask him, well, that's a great thing because look at the next slide. We ask them. We need to start asking them, right? How will you pay for your plan? So we've come up with a whole bunch of questions. We'd love to hear more questions from you guys. Um, how will you pay for your plan? Will your plan cost more or less than what we currently spend on health care? Does your plan have cost savings to offset covering, making, you know, making coverage universal, right? Does your plan provide any administrative savings for doctors or hospitals? Ours does. Does yours? Keep asking. Does somebody who already has private insurance save money? Medicare for all, in general, we think will save 95% of the population money. Can they say that? Nobody's asking, I don't understand. Uh, how much will the average person save? How does your plan benefit seniors? Seniors are gonna get all of that coverage that we talked about, including long-term care. This is amazing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. What services do your plan cover? Does your plan cover long-term care? Yeah. Can anybody think of other questions that we ought to be turning back on the, the public option folks? And the, okay, let's, uh, let's start the looking at uh, sort of <laughs> Yeah, I think we should ask how many deaths will be stopped by your plan? How many bankruptcies will be stopped by your plan? So does your plan, in addition to long-term care, which we know none of them do, does your plan cover dental comprehensively? Does your plan cover mental health? What we used to call the two owls, dental and mental. Um, <laughs> And of course, does your plan provide drug coverage without any co-pays? Oh, gee. <laughs> Great. How will your plan prevent a two or three tiered healthcare system where the poor as usual get the less care? How will you have a sustainable system under this plan? Great. Yep. <laughs> What is the cost of lives, American, anyone loving America's lives on your plan? How many people will you allow to die on your plan? And the smart folks at Harvard and other places have calculated for legal reasons when they're doing malpractice lawsuits and stuff, the, the cost of a quality of life and how many quality of life years you have left, and they can quantify that for the legal system. So take their millions of lives they're willing to let die on their plan and put a price tag to that, and let's that add to that to the, to the cost. <laughs> I'd like to add to the woman who who talked about the two-tier system. Mm -hmm. Rural Minnesota, rural America is in the second and third tier, mm -hmm. and I'd like to know how are they going to save our health care system for all of our rural people and save the health care for our farmers. Does your plan cover hospice? Oh, right, right, right. Does your plan take the burden of health care off employers? Mm. Nice. Will your plan end medical bankruptcy? Mm. And, um, what will happen to the money after you take the money? You, know, you take the money out of the employer, if employers are paying, are the employers going to give it back to the employees as wages, since they're always their wages anyway? Adding on to what you said, will your plan, you know, 
equalize the inequities in health care in this country. <coughs> Quality facilities in both rural areas where we're seeing them leave, and both inner, um, inner city areas where they're serving a poor population. Did your plan cover undocumented immigrants? Yeah. yeah. What I always think of is will your plan allow the government enough power to stop? hospital mergers, pharmaceutical companies, and other folks who want to conglomerate as much power as they can and just rip it from their hands. Will your plan prevent a high-risk pool? Mm -hmm. Nice. folks keep talking about is that it's going to create competition. And so what I want to ask folks that are pushing this is, what are you going to do when somebody gets up for a private plan that maybe costs less, but then when they actually need the care, they're denied care? So what are you going to say to those folks then? So they'll have a, a short, like a, a cheaper premium <laughs> because they don't have care. Focus plan. Focus plan. How does it stop the focus plan? Right. All right. Can say that again? Can somebody just summarize that? Focus plans. How do we stop the focus? All right, we'll take one last one. This is a, a little bit different, but I'm just listening to the words that are being used in this room, and we're, we keep using the word plan. And I think if you don't spend a lot of time thinking about health care finance plan, to you, you, a regular person, means your insurance plan. So we need to be very careful we're not confusing people. We're not talking about insurance plans. We're talking about payment systems. So when you're out there asking these really good questions, make sure you're saying, what does, like, does the public option create a two-tier system? Because people understand that. But if you say, does your plan, they're going to think, I don't know, does the Cross Blue Shield create a two-tier system? So we have to make sure we're talking at the level that a regular person thinks at. They're not <coughs> thinking about it the same way you are. Great, thank you. Um, we've got birdies at the end. Well, last one? <laughs> All right. And Warren. <laughs> From the point of view of a healthcare provider, one of the real pitfalls is the inability of people to keep continuity of care with established doctors, nurses. And um, I think one of the important questions are how are you going to? Sure that we are not forced to change who we see as a result of your choice. Catherine, how are you on time? Can you take two more? <coughs> So yeah, I want to piggyback on that and the choice thing. So as a physician, does it simplify my life as a physician so I can just take care of my patients without all of this crazy paperwork and bureaucracy getting in the way? Does it reduce my overhead costs? Does it make me a doctor again instead of an accountant? <laughs> right. Yeah, the burnout is just insane. As long as two candidates. Okay, can you guys show me now? Yes. 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 <laughs> now, uh, the one thing that we were just talking about is about can people, like if you change your plan, I've actually been on one plan while I was, uh, had a doctor, a great doctor report for many years. After a while, he stopped taking my health care. So, can, um, let me see, what was the question? Be? If we're satisfied with our health care plan, can, is there a way that we can just stay with that same one and stay with the uh, DOC, POR? That's uh, the wrong way to say it. Right. We shouldn't have and I always keep my doctor because I always keep my hospital. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's not fair. You got to get one. Only single time that's not fair. One insurance, everybody takes it. Period. The end of story. No 
with the plans. What I really like about the way you said that is, can I keep my doctor? I have a doctor who I've been seeing, I have a good relationship with, or a nurse practitioner, or any kind of provider. I, I want to keep that care under your plan, under your uh, health care payment system, under your proposed health care uh, system. Can I keep seeing my doctor? Can you guarantee it? Right. Right. So that's uh, just, uh, you know, I just like that, that that was a personal question. Not can somebody, but can I? Okay, this is really the last one. We're together. We're together. I don't know if this is the time or the place to, to mention this. But one of the questions with funding and everything is what is going to happen to all the insurance company employees that, you know, if they're spending hours and hours Two for a five day years. working on insurance forms that are no longer going to be necessary or needed. Give one life, please. And what, you know, what is going to happen to those employees? Or is there going to be retraining or, you know, what? It's in the bill. So under anybody else's uh, proposals, that's not a question because they're not planning to get rid of private insurance companies. But it's a key question under Medicare for All. So you can come to the afternoon workshop on just transition. Um, but that has to be based into whatever we do. It cannot be an afterthought. Um, so just transition. So I'm glad you asked that. It's really key that we don't say, okay, we've got that care for all. Now let's, you know, spend a few bucks uh, on the workers. That's got to be uh, part of the proposal from the very beginning. And it is. substantial wage increase. That's the, it's a two-part answer. So number one, we're going to pay for the health care. Number two, a wage increase. Who here doesn't want a wage increase? Okay? Thank you. comprehensive coverage. And we know we can do that and save money and shift the burden. And I think there was pretty general consensus in this room that we should shift the burden to the super wealthy, right? So it's really not a policy issue at this point, right? It's a political issue. Is there the political will to do this? And do we have the power to make it happen? So we just wanted to leave you with some encouragement on that front with the next slide, which is a bunch of very recent polls on how uh, U.S. voters feel about wealth taxes, taxing the wealthy, and so forth. So that that 2% wealth tax that we talked about, 66% of uh, voters polled um, uh, agree that that could be uh, done. 
Uh, 69% believe that corporations are paying too little in taxes. Uh, wealthiest Americans should pay higher taxes, 63%, and corporations, 66%. So the will of the people is with us. We need to build the power to make this happen. Thank you very much.